Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Eagle Community Church of Christ podcast. My name is John Gunter. I want to thank you again for uh, just listening to our podcast each and every week. Uh, we'd, we'd love it if you'd recommend this as well so we can uh, get the word out as our, our church comes into this new area of Mont Bellevue, Texas. This week, again, we're talking about the parables of Jesus. And we talk about two. We talk about the banquet, and then we talk about this parable Jesus tells about two sons. Uh, both of these um, re- really kind of have a, a similar vein to them, and maybe you've not read them before uh, side by side. And so uh, hopefully today what we can do is, is make the tie to these and see uh, really a big point that Jesus is making to the religious leaders, the church people of the day. So again, we hope this is beneficial. Come see us sometime. Well, thanks for being flexible with us this morning. Uh, I even had Katie bring my laptop as a backup, and that didn't work. So um, it just wasn't meant to, to go smoothly today. And that's okay. That's okay. Thus is life, right? We, uh, we continue today with our study in different parables of Jesus. Today we're going to cover two more. If it will advance. We've got two, one from Luke 14, verses 15 through 24, which is the banquet, and another from Matthew 21, which is about the two sons. I'm going to be reading from uh, my phone as well, so uh, if I get too lost on this, y'all, y'all just bear with me. When, uh, when Jesus sets this up, again, as, as we have told you week after week, a lot of these interactions, a lot of these parables come when Jesus is conversing with religious leaders. Uh, Jordan talked to you about how uh, so many times, maybe all the time, that when something negative is happening, it will just say, and Jesus was talking with the Pharisee, uh, versus when something good happens, you'll, you'll learn the Pharisee's name. And so to set up this banquet scene, Jesus again finds himself in the home of a Pharisee. Jesus did not back down uh, from the challenge. He knew the Pharisees were out to get him. He knew that they wanted to trap him in any way that they could, yet he continued to go. He continued to go and sit in their very homes to be challenged and to be questioned and all of these things. Uh, The scene begins like this. It says, one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, so he's very prominent, again, not giving his name, he was being carefully watched. Do you think Jesus knew that? Of course he did. Being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisee and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And guess what they said? They said nothing. They remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they still had nothing to say. Isn't that interesting? The scene goes on to where Jesus notices as people walk in to the banquet feast that this Pharisee is putting on that they don't just sit anywhere. They don't wait for others to be seated. They walk in the door, much as you did this morning, and they find the best spots to eat. They want to find the head of the table. Where is the most important place? Where is the the host going to sit? I want to sit near him. I want to be close to power. And Jesus warns him. He says, "Look, look at what you're doing. He says, when you come to a banquet, don't pick the best seat. Because what might happen is the person that invited you, the important person here, may come in and see, I don't want to pick on anybody on this, John, John, why are you sitting there? Why don't you move down here and you'll be humiliated? And then he says, just pick the worst seat and then you can actually get this this blessing that when the powerful inviting person comes in he can look at you and say hey move up to this best place sit by me or sit sit at this good place at the table and then all of a sudden okay you're important you're not humiliated right and so Jesus everywhere he goes is trying to teach a lesson in, in what he's doing here And uh, what Jesus says is those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And the only thing that anyone says, remember, he's just asked them these questions 
where he's being carefully watched, and they said nothing. But when Jesus finishes this scene, someone decides to say, hey, blessed is the one who eats, who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Well, why are you speaking up now? When Jesus asked the tough question, you didn't have anything to say. You came to watch him, but now, hey, let me, let me get a good word in here. Maybe I'll be, you know, on, on good terms now. But he says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, well, I have just bought uh, five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And some of you are thinking, well, yeah, that's a good excuse right there, right? I just got married, so I can't come. Jesus says, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. There we go. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus tells this story to a room full of people at a banquet, right? Do you think they, they, they got the, the gist of this? That all of a sudden Jesus has a, a very pointed uh, parable about people eating at a banquet. And Jesus says all of these people who were first invited, what'd they do? They all had excuses. They all had reasons why they could not come. One has a field, one has oxen, and one just got married. And we think, man, that's, that's a good idea. Maybe you shouldn't come. He's in the doghouse otherwise. <laughs> I sent my wife a, a, a funny TikTok video this morning. And uh, <laughs> the, the caption was, all wives. So you know it's good when it says all wives. <laughs> when we're that general, you know it's true, right? And uh, it's like all wives, when you get a delivery... And it, showed, it was the husband dressed up as his wife. And uh, he got an Amazon box. He took it out. And he said, ah, I'm done with this. And he walked outside. He took the whole box instead of breaking it down, gentlemen. You know what I'm talking about. And throws it into the garage. And I thought that was so funny. And so I sent it to Katie. And uh, she sent back. She said, ha ha. She said, now show the one where the guy just opens the box and leaves everything right where it was sitting. I said, Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But isn't it funny to kind of laugh at ourselves? And that's what Jesus, again, Jesus, as he tells these parables, tries to connect real life, right? Like you feel some of this in the excuses. Now, your excuse may not be, I've got oxen, and I don't know how many of you would buy a field prior to going and looking at it. But we all have our excuses of why we don't come to God. Or why I can't help out, why I can't serve right now, don't we? Maybe we just need to sit and think about that for a minute. All of these things could be seen in our culture as very acceptable excuses for why we cannot do something. How many other things could we throw up there? I have a sporting event. I can't come. Last week, it it made me angry, and I guess it kind of gave me a refresher as to where we are. Uh, It was last week. Evan had a a game on Saturday, a soccer game. Well, that got rained out because it rained overnight, and they're very gentle with the fields over there, Tyler. Um, But they rescheduled the game. We'll just move it to the same time, 1030, on Sunday. And I thought, no, we need to set the precedent right now between 
everybody at the t- on the team, the coach, they understand where we are, and I need to teach my son a lesson. That this is not an excuse. I've told you guys that uh, I played a lot of baseball growing up, and I would come in, we'd have a gospel meeting, and I'd come in with red dirt on me, and Mom would have a beach towel laid over the pew. But I wasn't going to miss. And that's ingrained in me. And so we've got to ask ourselves, what kind of, what kind of lessons are we teaching our kids by what we do? What is it that will make me miss or not serve or not come? And often those things might be a little embarrassing. And again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here just to, to preach at you. I'm preaching at myself because I, I told you when I was in uh, working in IT, uh, there were weeks where during the middle of the week, on Wednesday, Katie would come in. We were both working. And she would have to ask the question, are we going to church tonight? And sometimes we didn't. But there were some times where it's like, well, I'm committed to this group. I'm committed to God. I don't feel worth a a darn, but I need to go. And every time I did that, I promise you, every time I did that, I received a blessing I didn't know was out there for me. And listen, I'm hard-headed enough, and I've told you guys this, some of you heard this, you're going to roll your eyes, but I would tell Katie on those nights, some of those times I just didn't feel like anything, and I said, yeah, we're going, but we're, going, we're leaving quick. <laughs> Do not tell God that, because I promise you, every time I said that, I was the last one, the janitor was sitting around going, we closing up, and can I turn this last light off, because y'all are still here talking, but I received a blessing. And you think about it, as Jesus tells this parable, all these people who had all these excuses that these important things I'm doing to miss out on this, they didn't know what blessing they were going to get. And that's how it is with God. Because if you're not fully in it, you don't understand what kind of blessing you receive by being fully in. God says, I'm going to fill my house. The first ones invited don't want to come. I'm filling my house. And you know that these Jewish people we're probably going, what in the world? Because as we've talked week after week, often they were looking at these others, people that were not them, people that they deemed lesser. And they saw themselves kind of on this pedestal. They could do no wrong. And so it's kind of standing on self-righteousness. Kind of standing here being okay with my status because I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm a descendant of David. But what Jesus is saying is all of you are missing it. What you're seeing here is these other people are getting in and you're not because of your excuses. The same thing kind of happens uh, in the parable of the two sons in Matthew 21. Uh, Jesus, again, kind of starts out, if you back up from this, uh, this parable, Jesus, again, asks a couple of questions. He asks questions about Uh, John the Baptist. Remember, they're the ones trying to trap him in this moment. And Jesus asked him some questions about John the Baptist, about, uh, you know, what was he doing here and and how should we take this? And and what you get here in in Matthew is, is you get what they were thinking. Well, we can't say this because then he'll say this. Well, we can't say this because then he'll trap us here. And so Jesus gets them every time they are trying to trap him. And so again, in both of these things, Jesus has asked questions they refuse to answer. Isn't that interesting? You're not going to trap me. I'm just not going to say anything. And he says this parable. He says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. The son said, I will not. So the father got out the belt. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. What this is called in both of these parables is uh, what if, if you went to a Christian college today, 
you would hear the term divine reversal. And so what we or what the religious leaders of the day think, we're the ones getting in, we're better than everyone else. Jesus says in both of these parables, you're wrong, they're getting in. And so they flip the script, so to speak, right? But Jesus tells this about two sons. The first one says, no, but then he does it. The second one says, sure, but then does not. And he asks, he says, well, which one do you think did what the father asked? And of course they said, the first one. Now, this kind of hits home for me because I think, of, I think of this as when I would plan things for my youth group and I would have most of the kids say, yes, I'm going to this event. And then as I worked in youth ministry, I, I started to understand that yes means maybe if I'm in a good mood and if nothing else comes up, and if you'll tell me who else is going and if I like them. <laughs> All of those things in one. And it drives you nuts. And so I kind, of, I kind of relate that to this, you know, that uh, there were times where I had some kids that were really good. Like the kids that would say, no, I've got stuff to do. There'd be a kid there say, uh, let me work on that. And then all of a sudden they would bring other people in and you would see this. And so I get what he's saying. He's just using you know, common everyday experiences to prove a point here. He said, the one who said yes, but then doesn't do it, is the one who didn't do what the father wanted. And so as church people, we have to think about this, don't we? as so many of us in this room have, have stood and pledged and committed our lives to Jesus, we've stood up here every week, week after week, with a mirror saying, we better be looking in this and making sure this is still the case, right? Because it could be that we, just as the Pharisees, these religious leaders were doing, we may be resting on our status. We may be resting uh, on an idea that we are saved, that we said yes at our baptism, that we committed our life to Jesus, but maybe since then we haven't done what we said. And Jesus doesn't give a lot of details here. He, he tells parables in a way that just connects to everyday life. And again, we could fill in details and, and make it our own kind of thing to, uh, to reach us. But you think about, okay, what is it that's keeping me from doing this? What is it that's stopping me from doing exactly what I said I was going to do? Because we all have good intentions, don't we? You ever heard the saying that we judge everyone else on their actions, but we judge ourselves on our own intentions? So if you do something to me, I just assign those bad intentions that you had. You know, you didn't show up for my thing. I assign bad intentions. Now, that might not have been the case, but I see those actions. And I interpret them as you just, you know, bad into bad person. But me, if I miss something, well, I needed to or something was wrong, you know, or something. And so I'm always the good guy, right? You're always the bad guy. And so I ask you this morning, what is it that, that's standing in your way? How is it that we can live into that commitment that we've said we have for the Lord? What is it that's stopping you? I tell everybody I need a calendar because if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. And I'll just, I'll just admit right here, there have been times where someone has, uh, you know, posted on Facebook or something, hey, would you pray for them? I'm like, hey, I'm praying right now. And something happens. And I think about it probably three days later. Life happens like that, doesn't it? So whether or not this is, this is this idea of someone intentionally walking away from God or someone who just by, they have good intentions, but stuff gets in the way, life comes at us, and all of a sudden those other things kind of feel more important in the moment. I really like uh, cold case files. Anybody watch that kind of thing? Am I the only one the FBI is looking into right now? <laughs> But, you know, all of the cold case files where someone's been killed and then that goes into a cold case, every single one is, well, something new came up and we had to work on that. And we understand that, right? 
We understand you got to, especially in this particular situation, you got to investigate that when it's new, right? But we often treat our life as if it's that new murder case that is so important that I've got to get to it right now, forget that I had this commitment. And so when I was working with my youth group, I mentally, I blamed a lot of the kids. But as time has gone on, I thought, no, a lot of adults have the same attitude. It's really yes, unless. Yes, unless. And then we don't have the commitment that we once had. We don't have the, uh, the people in our lives showing us how to have this commitment, to skip out on other things that life brings. I remember even on, uh, it makes me think even of uh, our offering, our giving. Um, you know, when we, when we meet at the park, less people give. That's okay. We're out of our element. But when I was growing up, if, if you missed a week, what'd you do? You doubled up. You caught up. Uh, when I was at my church in Texarkana, every fifth, win, or every fifth Sunday, we had double up contribution. And I told the elders, uh, I said, I'm not doubling up. I give. You know, I have already purposed what I'm going to give. And the elder looked at me and said, yeah, but a lot of people don't do that. (laughs) Because just like our everyday life, our commitments go and come with our money, with our time, with everything. And so Jesus is sitting here looking at a bunch of church people saying, Don't rest on what you think. Don't rest on this idea of uh, you're self-righteous because you, uh, in this case, were given the word of God. You said yes. You, You take pride in being who you are in your ancestry to being a child of Abraham, yet you're not the ones getting in. It's the people that you look down on. It's the down and out. It's the the woman weeping, drying Jesus' feet with her very hair. Those are the people that get it. So I don't have a mirror this morning, so anxiety can be all right. But every time, every week, we've got to think, all right, where am I right now? Because if we look into the mirror and we simply lie to ourselves, that's not doing us any good, is it? Being challenged is difficult. To find out that you're wrong is even more difficult. I feel like I've been punched in the stomach. Oh, no, I've got to change. I hope that's our attitude, though. As difficult as it may be to look into that mirror, that we've got to be honest with ourselves and we've got to make the changes when we need to. James, again, says... This, if I can get to it here. And I mean, I can. I waited too long, Paul. Oh, I didn't even finish my last verse there, did I? Or verse 32 before I go into James. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes, maybe, are getting in ahead of you. I've got a lot of this in my brain, but I don't know if I memorized it that well. (laughs) James 1.22, do not merely listen to yourselves. Listen to yourselves. Listen to the word. I'm just going to be all over the place here. I'm not. Just leave it right there. Yeah, it's going to move. I'm going to do this fast. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks, again, intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Jesus says something that's very difficult for us to hear. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You understand that? Let me say it one more time. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says people will approach him in the final days and say, Jesus, we have done so many wonderful things in your name. And Jesus says, hey, come on in. That's great. No, he does not. He says, I'm going to say to some people, I never knew you. 
something went wrong in your life. And maybe you even thought that you were doing the work of Jesus. But he says, not everyone who calls me Lord is going to enter. So we have to look into the mirror. We have to look intently, as James said. We have to remember what we look like and just make the changes necessary. Not that we just strap on our belt and do hard work. We do that, but we also ask God to change us. And that's a scary prayer. God, convict me of the things that, that maybe I don't even see right now. Maybe I am the person who feels like I've been calling Jesus Lord for a long time and Jesus is sitting there, I don't know you. God, convict me if that's where I am. Can we pray that prayer this morning? Convict me that I need to change, that I am not yours when I maybe I'm resting in my status that I am. And so that's our challenge this morning. Again, we want to, even though we're out at Cove, we've got a chance to pray for each other. I'd love to pray with you this morning if, if something has gone wrong, if, if you just need the prayers of this church for any reason. We'd love to do that. Uh, we've got places available. If you'd like to be baptized this morning and make that commitment right now, this morning, to start walking with Him, we can do that as well. Uh, again, I want to thank you for being here. And again, let's look intently into the mirror of God's Word showing us who we should be and who we should follow. If you have any needs, would you come and be here?